views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. The Bronx political landscape has been changing, certainly since the primary on June 23rd. Uh, we have a whole new look at a congressional delegation in the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th congressional districts. And maybe riding under the radar are new candidates who have uh, won the Democratic primary in the New York State Assembly. Uh, tonight, we have three of those candidates with us. Uh, two of whom uh, ran on empty seats, and the other one ran in a situation where the incumbent uh, was taken off the ballot uh, for allegations of fraud. Uh, and so uh, this evening, we're going to get a chance to uh, talk with each of them, uh, find out what their thoughts are on some of the most important issues of the day. And there are obviously many important issues of the day. Uh, we should mention that in all three cases, there are Republican and conservative challengers. So we'll uh, take nothing for granted other than to present the winners of uh, the Democratic primaries. The final word will belong to the voters on November 3rd. But right now, let's uh, introduce uh, the three uh, Democratic primary uh, winners, and uh, they will be the Democratic candidates on November 3rd. Uh, good evening to uh, Chantel Jackson from the 79th uh, Assembly District. She's the Democratic nominee in that district. Uh, Chantel, nice to see you. Hey, Gary. And also uh, in the 84th Assembly District, uh, Amanda Septimo, she uh, was, uh, 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 I don't say elected, she was, um, won the primary for the Democratic nomination. Uh, the incumbent, uh, Carmen Arroyo, uh, as I mentioned, was uh, taken off the ballot, but Amanda has now emerged as the Democratic candidate in the 84th. Nice to have you with us, Amanda. Thank you and for having also, me, Gary. Great, and also uh, in the 85th, Assembly District, Marcos Crespo has stepped down and that is an open seat as well. And so Kenny Burgess joins us uh, right now. So uh, Mr. Burgess, nice to have you with us, sir. Thank you for having me, Gary. And so many issues to talk about. I uh, would love to get your uh, impressions of uh, a number of different things. Let's just start with Black Lives Matter and um, it, the relationship between the people of the Bronx and the NYPD. And I'm gonna give you a little background. We, we all know what's going on here. I mean, there's no secrets, it's well publicized, that um, we, we had a very strong movement. People of the Bronx are very passionate, uh, and by and large, about Black Lives Matter. On the other side of the coin, and I have been in this seat for a long time, people have always said, we want a good police force. We want a police force that's strong and fair and um, uh, you know, plays by the rules. Right after all of that happened, we had an enormous spike in, um, in, in shootings in the borough of the Bronx, which is so disturbing. So um, Ms. Jackson, let's just start with you and everybody can weigh, I know you all have something to say about this. What do we do now? And, and maybe you can even trace back, why did we get a spike like that of shootings right at the time when, wait a minute, you'd think that Black Lives Matter would wanna show a peaceful movement forward and uh, then, of course, uh, the NYPD um, is also, uh, I talk to police officers, they're very upset. They try to do it, most of them, of course, try to do a good job. And, and now they've got a mess on their hands. So, Ms. Jackson, let's just start with you. We'll go around the room. What do you think? Yeah, so thank you, Gary, for having us on. Um, it, there's a lot of reasons to why we're in the situation we're in. And I'm going to say that Black Lives Matter, <clears throat> the movement, has to do with uh, police brutality, has to do with crime that happens, violent crime that happens to black people and just making everyone aware that our lives matter. And the reason for the spikes in, in shootings and death in our, in our 
community has to do with lack of resources. This is a mental health issue that we're not addressing, that we have not been addressing, and a lack of resources. So when people have things to do, places to go, um, training, jobs, things that you know worth living for, they don't, they're not out being violent, shooting people, killing people. This is a mental health uh, issue that we haven't necessarily dealt with, and this is something that we need to be discussing at this point. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, Mr. Burgos. I'm, I'm a big data person, right? So I went through, I combed through the data uh, crime citywide over the years, recently 2019 and now, and even borough-wide. Now crime overall is still down, even to this day, year to date. Shootings are definitely up, but it's not specific to the Bronx or New York City. We have shootings up nationwide. So the conversation we're having, you know, with uh, the, you know, Black Lives, Matter, Black Lives Matter movement with, you know, um, defunding the NYPD, I don't think that has a direct correlation in our shootings, right? I think really the correlation with the shootings increasing is COVID. It's fallout from COVID. I mean, you have people who are unemployed. You have people who, like Chantel said, lack of resources, mental health not being addressed, and it's just only gotten larger during this crisis. And as always, it's that tale of two cities. So the large proportion of, of those issues has fallen on our outer boroughs, on our minority communities. And you don't see that maybe like in Manhattan or so where our shootings are up in the Bronx. So I think shootings, again, it, it comes to, again, like Chantel said, a lack of resources, but really it's a fallout from COVID-19 and not so much uh, what people will say have been anti-police or because of the protests we've had or anything of the sort. It's really just, again, lack of resources, COVID fallout, and you know, mental health um, going untreated. Uh, and we're going to get Ms. Septimo right into the dialogue, but I just want to follow up with that. Do you see this as a legislative issue that, that when you go, to, if you go to Albany, uh, that this is something you're going to undertake in some form? Or is it really more a social issue that needs to be addressed? And then Ms. Septimo, don't go away because you're getting it next. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's certainly twofold. I mean, social, a social issue is always going to be one, but legislatively, you can, you know, the, the way you do it is reinvest in your communities. I mean, it's something we say all the time, but we've never really done it fully, right? So when you really reinvest in communities, when you invest in people, when you serve, when you give them mental health services, when, you know, we gave the, uh, the unemployment checks out, you know, th there's a real economic stimulus that, that comes into community and that really helps to solve a lot of the crises we have, your health disparities, again, people are able to pay their bills. And, you know, it's just a multi-factor approach to, helping again with crime and bringing the shootings down and just changing your overall society and the overall neighborhood. So I think you can legislate it and I think it's a societal issue as well. This bridges social, into- Not legislative issues though. Say okay. that again, Ms. Jackson? Social issues and legislative issues are the same thing for me. Like everything should be about the society and what's best for people. Uh, Ms. Septimo, uh, this leads right into the phrase defund the police. And, and uh, when I heard that, I was like, well, I understand what you're saying. And if you're telling me you're going to take that billion dollars, uh, you know, that, that the uh, city reapportioned and you're going to put it into community centers and into some of the services that we just heard talking about, uh, I, I like that idea. On the other hand, it is used as a weapon. What, what does defund the police mean to you in relation to all of the, the dialogue that we've just had? Yeah, that's an important question. I think uh, the defund, the, the messaging around defunding the police is actually connected to much of uh, what Chantel and Kenny just said, which is really taking resources in a bloated police department budget and recommitting them to the parts of the community that have been underfunded for a long time. Um, and so you mentioned legislative fixes. I think some really interesting kind of easy layup programmatic fixes that we could see happen are gun buyback programs that right now pay $200 for every gun that you get off the street. Um, I won't pretend to know what a gun goes for on the street right now, but it's a lot more than $200. And so if we want to get realistic about approaching crime seriously and getting <laughs> guns off the street, then we need to also be investing in programs like that and be realistic about how we approach these things. Um, and so I think defunding the NYPD, again, is really connected to just shifting resources. And I agree with you in the point that you made, Gary, that communities, I think communities like the South Bronx as well, do want police forces that they feel can keep them safe, that are there for them. Um, I think when you look at data, like Kenny mentioned, and you look at the patterns that have happened with policing in New York, that's just not been what's happening as it relates to communities of color. Um, a small example is jaywalking tickets, upwards of 90% of them going to people of color in this city. Um, you just can't separate 
race and policing in New York. And until we can really approach that really hard conversation, I think it's fair to say, okay, let's re-examine how all of these resources are being used when a lot of parts of our community are really struggling. I, I wanna follow up with you then. Um, is part of the problem, and I, you know, I step back and I see just like everybody else, um, is the leadership in the city because you know the mayor uh, and um, um, the uh, former uh, health commissioner didn't get along and now she's no longer the uh, health commissioner. On the other hand, Dermot Shea came out and said some very, very strong things about um, uh, the city's policies as regards policing, and yet he is, seems to be still celebrated as the police commissioner. Um, where, where does leadership in the city play? And um, how, how, what would you recommend uh, for working it out so people trust their police department? This to me is a large part of it uh, and, and part of the so-called unrest that leads to shootings and all these other things. So each one will get a chance, but Ms. Septimo, uh, you have the floor, why don't we go there? Yeah, I mean, I think the first, the most important approach is really trusting people from their communities to lead. Um, and I think that that means allowing there to be dissension, allowing there to be tension, allowing there to be that friction that requires um, growth, right? Because I think the only way we're gonna get to the other side of these really difficult issues is burrowing through these really hard moments. Um, so it was really unfortunate to see um, the commissioner of the health department um, seemingly kind of dismissed uh, in her official capacity and then ultimately leave the administration because of that. And I do think that our our citywide leadership has to think long and hard about how at every turn it is allowing communities that are impacted by the work to be leading, not only through representation, but through programming, through um, advising, um, and through funding. Uh, Ms. Jackson, the same thing for you. I mean, th this is such a core issue. Because, again, I'm even thinking from the point of view of the police officers, and I know many in, in the Bronx, and uh, they're upset. They, they feel like, hey, we put our lives on the line. We work in line. We work in line. We work in circumstances. And, um, and, and uh, you know, and, and uh, we're getting you know, beat on. We're getting beat on. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I 100% back Amanda on what she's talking about. And what I will say is that it's important for our police to understand that they are civil servants. Their job is to serve the people. They're paid through our tax dollars so that they can serve our communities. And in white communities, you know, there's, there's no question of like how safe people feel when police are around. In black communities and brown communities, we are questioning if we are safe when they are around. And so it is, you know, I went to a, a um, anti violence rally yesterday held by the NYPD and Darcel Clark was there, our Bronx DA. And what I noticed was the kids were having a great time. Parents are out and about. The officers were there um, just standing there. And I think what they lack is the ability to go to people and just have regular conversation. We need to start seeing our officers as just regular people instead of just this person with a badge and a gun um, who may take our, our life. And so I think you know, it's, it's, it's the duty of our officers, the duty of our, our elected officials, the duties of everyone that's, that's in power to start those conversations, not wait for the community to come to them necessarily, but be open, be engaging. Don't just stand around, you know, be, just be a presence that says that you're safe when I'm here. Uh, Mr. Burgess, uh, Mr. Burgess same, thing for you. same thing for you. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I mean, partly with Amanda and Chantel, what they said, and I'll just follow up a bit more with your point on leadership. You know, I think the importance is really having effective collaboration. So when you have the police commissioner and you have the mayor seemingly not on the same page on what policing looks like in New York City, because maybe the mayor is being torn between the NYPD union and maybe between city council members or activists or state legislators, uh, it, it doesn't work for anyone because we seemingly go nowhere, right? So we have issues on both ends that are not being addressed. And we feel like we're not being heard on, on either end of that argument. And I mean, we've seen that even on a larger scale, right, with um, with Governor Cuomo and, and the mayor who seemingly can't, you know, come to agreement on how we should handle a lot of the, the COVID-19 issues that we've had. So it really comes down to effective leadership, collaborating, getting on the same page, listening to the people, and then acting upon that in a very, very cohesive and effective manner. And as well, I, I was... I was really, in, I'm sorry, you finished what you were saying? I was really encouraged by the Save Our Streets um, activities and then we had uh, marches out there. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always feel like if 
I hate to put it this way, there's more of us than them. More people want peace than violence. And certainly in the Bronx, so, you know, we have people who really feel strongly about getting in the streets and owning our own streets. So I, I was really uh, encouraged by that. I, I want to move to another topic, and let's start with you, Mr. Burgos. Um, the, uh, the whole question of schools and reopening. Uh, what is appropriate? Right now they're talking about, you know, two days one thing, three days another. Um, uh, and and what, what, for you, Mr. Burgess, what is in, uh, appropriate? What, what would you recommend? And how do you see it playing out so that we get our children educated and certainly we stay as healthy as we can be? Uh, I mean, it's certainly an incredibly difficult question, right? I mean, first and foremost, you know, these children are at very impactful times in their lives. You know, they don't have time to wait. We, we can't delay their education. We can't say, you know, you're not in school for another year because it can have huge impacts the rest of their lives. But on the other end, if we're as a city and as a state gonna say, it's unsafe to, you know, have a court hearing, if it's unsafe to have a chamber, have a session, you know, in the, in the legislature in person, how can we say it's safe to send kids to school? If we can't trust not trust, but if we don't, if we're not confident adults in an in enclosed space will not spread COVID-19 and have harmful effects across the state, how can we expect children to, you know, to take these rules and, and to socially distance and to keep their masks and to sanitize in, in, a, in a setting? So it's a conversation where we have to have their education continue, but I think safety and, you know, value of life trumps over all of it. And that should be the utmost importance. So until we feel that it's fully safe and, and we have the proper techniques and tools to implement education, whether it be in person or, or distance learning or uh, on a staggered schedule or whatever it may be, then I don't think we can implement any of them until safety is put first. Uh, of course, you know, there's many sides to this. Parents say, look, I got to go to work. And what are we doing with the children? And then on the other side of the coin, uh, we're talking about, um, uh, you know, do the children, are they really learning? Uh, do the, is there enough Wi-Fi? Is there enough, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, iPads and other uh, devices that, that uh, kids can have? Uh, Ms. Septimo, uh, your experience uh, through this, um, uh, I guess, through the early part of the pandemic when children were not in school, um, what, what are constituents or potential constituents uh, tell you? What are the people in the community saying? And what do you think about our schools? And I know Ms. Jackson has something to say because she got them kids. <laughs> and she, she's hoping to be in Albany. So that's another whole thing. Anyway, go ahead, Ms. Septimo, you first, and then we'll, we'll get to mom over there in a moment. Yeah, so I think that um, in this early part of the pandemic, I think we, I think everyone was just in a state of shock and kind of figuring out what's next. There's concerns around rent. There's concerns around jobs. There's concerns around health. Um, and so it was all this kind of melee. And I think now as we move into thinking about what returning to normal looks like um, and what the new normal will be, I think thinking about reopening schools is obviously at top of mind for a lot of people. Um, and I would actually love two things to happen. One, I think we really need to be lo looking to the workers who are gonna be inside school buildings. Um, that includes teachers, but that also includes maintenance workers, principals, um, workers who are impacted and who are going to be doing this work every day, um, because I think it would be irresponsible and uh, just unrealistic to make decisions about what happens in a school building without understanding the intimate details of it. Um, and then I would also love to see the city really dig into being creative around what spaces throughout the city are not going to be used or are underutilized um, for the foreseeable future, given the limitations on gatherings in the city because of the pandemic, and think about converting those into school buildings. Um, so I think about places like the Met Museum that I know is not going to be hosting large events um, for some time. And very lucky the kids who get to call the Met their classroom every day, right? But this could be an opportunity to dig into all of those spaces that we know exist throughout New York City. Um, and would it be a logistical nightmare? Absolutely. Um, but I think we're all called to do the hard work in this time. Um, and that's really an opportunity. Um, as Kenny said, this is an incredibly important time for kids and for students and for, for parents and teachers, and we should get it right. And if it means doing a little extra work, then it certainly feels worth it. Boy, what a, what a great semester that would be to be uh, have right. class in the, in the museum. I mean, you, you practically don't need to, you could study history, you could study you know, culture, you could 
study art and you can do anything right. you want. Um, uh, do you have, before we get to Ms. Jackson, and, and um, I'm curious, um, sympathy for teachers. Teachers say, well, wait a minute, I go into that classroom and uh, you know, I'm, uh, you've know, you got to, if you're a good teacher, we'd like to think you're in close with the kids, maybe not in direct proximity, but you don't want to, I mean, there are many stories of teachers uh, you know, who have been in classrooms and come home sick. Um, and they come home sick when it's just a cold, let alone a, a right. pandemic. Uh, what, what are your thoughts about teachers and the UFT and, and what, what their position could be? Yeah, I mean, I think it's impossible not to think about teachers. Um, and it would be wrong not to. I read this heartbreaking story recently about a teacher um, having a real conversation with her family about what life insurance would look like. Um, and I think there's some element of risk in being a person walking down the street um, but you, there's a reasonable expectation to go to work in a school building every day and be safe. Um, there, are some, there are some lines of work where you put your, line on, your life on the line every day and teaching shouldn't be one of them. Um, and that relates in everything to you know, school like gun violence, but also in this scenario, COVID. And so I think we do need to be looking and listening and learning from groups like U of T and, and the, the principals union um, everyone that represents workers in a school building and thinking about how these workers are going to be impacted. Yeah, I really think that there is a credibility issue that if, if everybody, and we're talking about parents and teachers and staff, if they believed when they were told that this was going to be safe, then they'd say, okay, this is how we're all going to do it. But there are, you know, some schools are more crowded than others. We know that the facilities and there's a lack of confidence when, and certainly we see what comes out of Washington that, that is not real accurate. And there's a lack of confidence that says, uh, yeah, go ahead into the school building. And then you're like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't look safe to me. Anyway, Ms. Jackson, and even, uh, go ahead. Sorry, yes, yes. just even the plan around that the city has released saying that schools will be cleaned on a nightly basis. We've seen a lot of council members speak up and say this is just not physically feasible. Um, and how these plans don't feel like they're grounded in realism. And I think speaks to your point of people not really feeling confident in this rollout and therefore confident in stepping back into a school building. And so I think it's, it would be um, inappropriate to not get some of those details hammered out better so that people can feel better about working in schools and sending their kids there. Uh, Ms. Jackson, go ahead. I know you have a lot to say. I'm itching. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I actually work in a school building. So this is, you know, my conversation every single day of the week. And I'm a mom. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it hits me on many levels. I remember when we decided that we were not going back into the school building, our school used to shake hands every single day just to greet kids, just to let them know that we're here. We, we are we, we see them, we, we want to acknowledge them if no one has acknowledged them for the day. And so we're changing how we do things um, to make sure that kids are safe, but we also want to make sure that they are educated and that they're getting the social emotional needs met. Um, for me, I think it, it should be up to the parents. I love the fact that they send out a survey for parents to f fill out to decide if they want to go remote, 100% uh, remote, or they want to do a hybrid, or they want to send their kids to school. In a school like mine, we are you know, creating some different types of uh, ways to roll out. We don't know if it's gonna be approved or not. Whatever my school uh, decides, if they decide I'm going into school one week or me one day, then I'm going to be there, stand up, serve, and take care of my students. Um, I just know that as a parent, I would not feel comfortable sending my child to school without a full proof plan that I could see what you know? What are you going to do? How, how's testing going to be handled? And we really don't have the capacity right now to do the, the amount of testing that we need to get done and the cleaning. Uh, we have one custodian with a custodian staff of uh, you know one direct custodian and, and then the staff of maybe like three or four. I can't see them cleaning a building every single day. Like they had a hard time just cleaning one building at the end of the school year when we when we all were told <laughs> to leave. So I just, I don't see how this is possible. I do listen to people at the UFT. I have a great relationship with them and we are in communication now about like what legislation should look like and what opening up should look like. One of the things that I think is exciting and was exciting to me to bring all three of you together, this really is, you know, the potential assembly delegation that will represent an entire swath of the South Bronx, which of course has been so needy for so long. So it's really, Interesting. We don't have a lot of time. We could do four hours here today, I'm sure, because we're getting into a lot of deep issues. But I do want to just touch on public housing, uh, because all of your districts have public housing, and it's you know vital that we um, improve what we've had. 
and public housing incredibly hard hit for many obvious reasons uh, during the pandemic. So Ms. Jackson, uh, let's start with you. We probably have about 45 seconds for each of you. Um, wh what do we need to do first and foremost? I know funding is out there. That may not be coming right away. What are your thoughts on public housing? Uh, Ms. Jackson, we'll yeah, start with you. I have about, I have about uh, 11 NYCHA developments in my district. I'm, I think it's 11. And so public housing has been an issue before the pandemic, and you can just imagine what it's like after. Um, people need real uh, help out here. They need a freeze on rent, but we also have to think about homeowners and building owners and how you know they still have to pay their mortgage as well. So there, there's a lot that needs to happen in a short amount of time. Um, and I'm not 100% I'm not sure what that's gonna look like, but I know I'm ready to work with Amanda and Kenny, and we're gonna figure this out together. Well, that, that's encouraging, and it's another reason why I wanted to bring all three of you together. Um, go ahead, Ms. Septimo, your thoughts on public housing? I know you have many um, uh, important thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, I think that, unfortunately, this pandemic has brought to the forefront a lot of the issues that have been kind of the, at the bedrock of the South Bronx struggling, um, and in public housing, that is directly connected to coronavirus and its impact um, specifically when you think about some of the issues that are related to maintenance, like black mold, and that leads to asthma, and this kind of cyclical um, process of problems. Um, and I think when, as it relates to public housing moving forward, funding is an incredibly important part of it, uh, but it's also thinking about what are the systemic changes that will move the system forward overall. Um, and so when we think about um, places that need new elevators, places that need new boilers, how do, we, how do we rectify the lead situation? How do we get to the heart of these issues that are causing long-term health effects for people and are very deadly, as, have potentially deadly consequences as we've seen in this pandemic? Um, and how do we essentially put our money where our mouth is? Um, a lot of people talk about public housing, a lot. Um, and if the funding matched the level of political rhetoric that NYCHA gets, then all of NYCHA's problems would be taken care of. <laughs> you know, although but, I don't know if there's enough money out there, especially nowadays. Um, exactly, but, right. Yeah. But, but it's a matter of priorities. We're going to have to make hard decisions in these couple of years. Um, and we just need to make sure that the hard decisions that get made don't always impact places like the South Bronx first, because that's historically what's happened. You know, I, I think that um, the phrase Black Lives Matter applies because I think the, over the course of decades now, people have been able to say, hey, well, I hate to put it this way, but, you know, it's them. And so they don't get funded. I mean, this to me is, aside from the interaction with the police force, this to me is one yeah. of the most important things is awareness raising. Wait a minute. You, we do matter. We are people, too. And therefore, where we live and all of our resources need to be um, uh, appropriately funded. Uh, uh, Kenny Burgess, you're the, um, you're the you're the data guy. What do, what, what do we think? Is there money out there? What what, what happens now? This, I mean, I know right now we're in, a, we're in a fiscal crisis, so there's a lot of questions as far as how much money we have and the deficits be filled. But as far as NYCHA, I mean, NYCHA has been historically underfunded for for how many years? I mean, so many years NYCHA has been underfunded, never receiving the amount of money that they so rightly deserve. And this is why we are where we are. You know, it's no question that. NYCHA has mold apartments, you know, uh, roofs that are crumbling, I mean, just in despair. And it's because we've never fully funded it. And right now we need to, like Amanda said, put our money where our mouth is. Too long, NYCHA has been from the back burner, whether it be, you know, lack of political willpower or, you know, people always find maybe better priorities. But we have thousands of residents, thousands of families, children that live within public housing and have a right to have a decent home, a home that, you know, that they pay to live in and be comfortable and, you know, be their own oasis. So, I think as legislators, as a community, and as a city and state, we need to, again, fully fund NYCHA, not privatize it, and, and make sure we bring those apartments and the entire community back to a level from what you began and what it deserves. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for joining us. As I said, we have, boy, I got, I got lists of issues here that we can go through. Uh, bring us want. back, Harry. Yeah. Well, uh, let's go after November 3rd. We'll determine uh, how it goes. Uh, we're, again, we take nothing for granted. But uh, Chantel Jackson, the Democratic nominee in the uh, 79th Assembly District, Amanda Septimo, the uh, Democratic nominee in the 84th Assembly District, and Kenny Burgess, the uh, Democratic nominee in the 85th Assembly District. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being new faces in the Bronx. Boy, us old folks need it. We, we're looking forward to having real good energy, and I, I feel real good energy from you guys. And uh, we'll see how it all plays out. We thank you for your time this evening.
And uh, guess what? We will see you folks next week on uh, Bronx Talk. Uh, stay safe, wear your mask, stay distant. Let's be smart and let's keep the Bronx strong, healthy, and safe. Good night.